And I think what's interesting about the metaverse, at least early on, is it's likely to be some mixture of social VR and, and gaming. And in fact, that's what you'll find to some extent in, in this world that Paul and Ed have created. The reason for kind of coming and having a chat with you, with you about this is that Facebook kind of pivots to meta and the metaverse. You've been dealing with virtual reality and mixed reality for decades now, is that right? I mean, why now? It's an interesting question. I mean, the metaverse as an idea, as a kind of an online mass social VR thing, I mean, that's been around for a long, long time. In fact, uh, before you were rudely interrupted me, I was reading Neil Stevenson's book, Snow Crash, 1992, which is where uh, in this cyberpunk novel, the, the term metaverse first comes up. Um, and there have been several attempts to kind of create metaverses over the years. Second Life and Active Worlds was a kind of big commercial try to roll it out. And I guess one of the questions that under, underlies whether you can do this is about just the infrastructure. Uh, is the world technically ready for it? Do people have powerful enough computers and devices? Are the networks fat enough? And, you know, I guess that Facebook, uh, Microsoft and others are now banking on the fact that we're pretty much there and we can really roll this out into to many, many people's homes. So who's going to be hosting this metaverse? Are Facebook trying to just get the get the jump on people? Yeah, I can't speak for what Facebook's business model might, might or might not be. You'd have to ask them. But I mean, you know, I, th I think it's interesting to think about why the different angles those bigger companies are coming from. I mean, as you know, as a... Uh, I guess, a social platform company that's invested in VR headsets, what, six or seven years ago now? You know, Facebook has been positioning themselves for a bit to, to take the step. You know, as a company that makes uh, computer games and platforms, Microsoft also might be coming at it from another angle. Is there a huge amount of server-side stuff happening to make this work? I mean, it's being created in Unity. I can tell that because it told me when I turned, <laughs> joined. But what, what's going on server-side? What's going on client-side? Can you talk us through it? The server side handles our communication and moving around, so where you see everyone else, and also messaging through the shout function. Whilst client side handles all the looks and how everything is portrayed, just to keep things simpler, the server side is combining three other technologies, which is Agora for the video and audio that you're hearing, uh, mirror networking, which is how we're moving the avatars around, and a service called PubNub, which is for the messaging that you'd see in shouting. So there are some technical challenges uh, which are quite interesting uh, from, from a research perspective about how you make this stuff scalable. Zoom calls, Teams calls, etc. they don't scale especially well. And they don't scale well for a few different reasons. So part of it's technical, part of it's about bandwidth. How many video feeds can you put on the screen at a time? And part of it's social. How do you organize a conversation with 100 people when only one person can talk at a time? And what we were interested here with was how do you take those 100 person Teams calls and make them socially functional, right? When you have, a, when you have 100 people in a real room, it's not the case that one person talks at a time. What happens is people distribute across the room. They spread spatially into smaller conversations. People whisper in the corners, they nudge each other. Even if you're in a kind of lecture environment, there's still a little bit of back channeling going on. But in a social environment, that's even more necessary for people to be able to form small social groupings. And this platform is all about spatializing those video calls, being able to go off into a corner but it's actually a little bit more than that because, first of all, we need to make it capable of handling more than a thousand people, right? Imagine a, a big music festival. So we've been looking at small music festivals, but imagine a Glastonbury where you've got a hundred thousand people there. The problem is everybody wants to go to the stage. Everyone's going to want to go to where the action is. So then you've got everybody in the same server where the action is. So how do you handle that? Well, our idea was to allow people to create what we call bubbles, which is why this system is called bubbles, or their own private instances of the world where only they and the people they want to share a video call with and the performers are part of that world. You're still aware of everybody else. Everybody else appears as sort of little ghostly avatars. But you have this high fidelity communication with just the small group of people that are in your bubble. And that creates this really interesting social question of how do you create 
bubbles? How should they be organized? Is it, you know, you buy some tickets and as a family group or a friend group, you're given a bubble? Or is it, here is a social bubble for dog lovers or a social bubble for people who are specifically interested in drinking Guinness or whatever, whatever social groupings there might be. I think that's quite an interesting uh, research challenge for us is to think about how you would structure bubbles, how you get people into bubbles, because it's both technically necessary to make the system scalable, but also socially necessary to make the social situation scalable. For me, the most interesting thing I think about it is that it merges this kind of digital world with real world social interaction, which is the kind of, it, it's the best of both really. Um, so it allows you to participate in social occasions from the comfort of your own home, but without losing the ability to connect with people on a kind of very human level in a really naturalistic way, which I really like. Yeah, I'm not, I really like this idea of kind of even just looking at the pose of someone. You can see if they're looking at you or talking to someone else or, or paying attention to something else. I mean, we're kind of using this a little bit like a Teams or a Zoom call, but it's just so much better because I can kind of go over here and talk to Steve or I can go and talk to Paul or I can go back to talk to Ed. So there are several core activities here. The most important one, because it's a festival, is the main stage. Just to show you how that works, I'm going to step onto the stage now. I'm now a performer and what's happening here is you can all see me regardless of what bubble you're in. We've increased the size of my avatar so that I appear on stage as a, a large on-stage performer. We've increased the audio quality of my avatar so if I want to play music to you um, I can. Go on then, come um, on, let's have some music. You know, I probably shouldn't. Come on, then, come on, let's have some music. Okay. Um, why not? Should really get Steve doing this. He's much better at this kind of thing. Should really have tuned my guitar before doing that. Never mind. <laughs> Anyway, where's the applause um, button? Where's the so applause, the idea applause is, button? Where's the applause button? <laughs> well, interestingly enough, we just had people jumping up and down in the uh, uh, in the festival and using that as applause. They found their own way of applauding. I like it. And the second set of features we've got is about um, media, asynchronous media. So when you look at a lot of online festivals, um, they're a mix of live performance and pre-recorded performance and videos. Um, and so we wanted to showcase that in here. This is using a set of green screen videos. So I'll let you go up to the video yourself because they're locally played. The second video format we wanted to look at was 360 video because here we are in a 3D world. Why not allow for 360 videos? We have these balls. And the balls are interesting because they're a way of presenting 360 degree video um, from the outside. And what essentially you do is you walk into one of the balls, and as you walk in, you'll find the video starts to play, and you can look around and feel like you're there. So you can view them from the sphere outside or yeah, go in. So the last is a more kind of standard video where we can walk up to a video and it starts playing. One of the companies we're in conversation with at the moment is a circus to look at how you might use volumetric video, 3D video capture, where you can actually look all the way around the video for yet another kind of form of in, um, embodied content in here. When you go to a festival, it's not just music, right? There's more there. There are sideshows, there are activities. And the Bouncy Castle and the Ferris wheel are there to provide that. They're just silly examples, but they're very easy to do. So the system already allows you to jump, but if you stand in the bouncy castle, you can jump a bit higher. It's like a bouncy um, castle, except no kids have been sick on it. <laughs> Quite. <laughs> I think one of the key things about this whole thing is that goes beyond being a Zoom meeting or a, you know, a Teams meeting is it's placeful. And, you know, one of the things we really wanted to create 
was the festival as a sense of a place that you go to, perhaps more than just watching a performance, you know, all of the other things that you can wander around and spend your time doing. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, um, you, you mentioned Placeful. We happen to be in um, Woolerton Park, by the looks of it. That's Woolerton Hall behind you, which is, is. some viewers may recognise as it was Wayne Manor in one of the Batman films. But that's in Nottingham, so that's where we are at the moment. Um, but one thing that's quite important for all this sort of stuff is is that idea of the state of the place and does it change? If I change something, will you see that change? So that is our kind of next goal. Um, we, have the, we have the technology, as they say, um, behind this. So we, we, know, we know how to do it. We haven't implemented it for this particular version. Um, but one challenge there is how you make that interact with the bubbles system the idea of we're in separate bubbles. So how do we sync the, the, the world itself? So you can sync objects. So we had this idea that in a specific bubble, you should sync the videos, the audio, the balls and the coconut shy, the gondolas and the Ferris wheel. Any kind of physical objects should get synced correctly for a specific bubble, but they don't need to be synced for a separate bubble. The question you might reasonably ask yourself is what happens if you switch bubbles? Mm. Whose world do you get, right? If I've got a ball from the coconut shy rolling across the floor and I join your bubble, should I join it where there's no ball rolling over the coconut shy or should I bring my rolling ball with me? And this is an interesting questions about negotiation, about ownership of bubbles. And that kind of ties us right back into metaverse and commercial ownership of the metaverse, right? So if I own this theme park, mm. right, then mm. should it be my version of the theme park that everybody gets or do they get to spawn off their own version of my theme park? If I build a house in here, imagine I'm playing Minecraft and I've got a server, if I build a house in the server and somebody hides off a version of that server, who owns it at that point? Yeah. And those are real challenges. Yeah. We've seen this before in Second Life and things like this. From a computer scientist, you know, kind of point of view, you know, Paul, I think, talk about something really interesting. When do you want the world state synchronised and when do you want it asynchronous? And in this kind of environment where it's kind of crowded with potentially lots of strangers, but you're also in it with some people that you're sharing it with, a small group of friends or family, you sort of want both. If I go up to the coconut shy, I don't want to have to wait for a thousand people to finish with it before I have my go. On the other hand, if I go up there with you as my mate, we want to play together. And Paul's notion of bubbles, that you can get into a little bubble with people, and that means you can share audio and video with them, and you can share world state. I think it's really nice for that. As long as my high school follows me, Steve, I don't really mind. Uh... <laughs> Another kind of tie back to the metaverse, the idea of there being virtual real estate that exists. When we start playing with this notion of bubbles, I can sell the same house 50 times to different people, all of whom are having that same address in the same location <laughs> and just happen to add this bubble to that address. And suddenly you get reusable real estate. What that will do to those people that want to sell digital real estate is another question entirely. But uh, I think it's an, interesting, it's an interesting question. I would move between, we originally called the system dimensions, this idea that you would have several dimensions of the same environment. It sounds like all you need to do is add the word blockchain to that and you've got an IPO ready to go. <laughs> have, you, have you used this for uh, meetings and things? I mean, can talk to me about that. Could this be something some people you know, use or jump into? So we used it for meetings in its own development, um, which was an interesting activity because uh, it, was, it was obviously building as we went along. So we were finding errors as we went along and finding quirks as we were, went along and working out how much audio attenuation was appropriate. And that's when you reduce the volume if you move away from people, right? Absolutely. Um, so yeah, we used, it, we used it for its own meetings. We also had our Christmas party in it, which was quite fun. Um, I dressed the world up for that. So we put snow on the ground. I replaced the trees with Christmas trees. We made a snowball fight mechanic. Um, and that's interesting end of itself because, so it, it pulled, the, pulled the mechanics out of the, the coconut shy, but allowed you to throw the balls at each other and score a point. And then we put up a leaderboard uh, in, in one corner of the room, or one corner of the space. Um, 
and it created this extra little layer of things to do in the space, specific interaction things to do. And a snowball fight's a funny thing because it isn't always between friends. You know, you, if you get a snowball fight in a village, people will just join in, even with strangers. Um, and I thought that was an interesting thing to play with, this notion of a, a, a competitive-ish, but not too competitive game that could just be snuck in to the environment so that if the conversation died down, you can just lob a snowball at somebody. Um, which, I mean, I've been in lots of academic conferences where occasionally I would like to just lob a snowball. Um, I think I was talking about this this morning, actually, that the, the first five minutes of a Zoom meeting or a Teams meeting when everybody's waiting for people to arrive, there's a rather awkward silence. And I like the idea of having a Ferris wheel or a coconut shy or a snowball fight just to fill that gap. Yeah, yeah. Perhaps there just needs to be an alarm to bring you back because, of course, you won't hear people starting to speak when you're at the other side of the... Uh, I mean... The, the, yeah, well, obviously, I'll, I wouldn't want to contribute to anything that blurs the definition between a, a party and a meeting. That would be, a, I think, a dangerous <laughs> thing to do. I think as long as you bring your own booze, it's absolutely fine. People sort of tend to agree in the visions of the metaverse that it's persistent. Mm. And, you know, and that, that means kind of several things. It means uh, it's kind of always there when you want it. But it also means that you can sort of change it and it stays changed. And it possibly means that you can own it mm. too. And that's been the business model of, of you know, things like Second Life in the past. And they can buy real estate in the metaverse. And I think it's very much the idea in the book. And then Paul's idea of bubbles plays with that in a crazy way. Because now you can also have parallel versions of the universe that are somehow connected. And now the question of who owns what becomes much more interestingly complicated. But, I mean, you know, just, just to kind of play devil's advocate people were selling an acre on the moon you know 20 30 years ago i've i've got an acre on the moon i'm hoping one day i'll get to visit it i mean um it's then probably comes down to who owns what server right and and you know feel like there's not going to be the money to be made for the mark zuckerbergs in this world if everything's open source i don't know what do you think and with a slightly more altruistic goal are the mechanics behind what we're doing with this software is to build a platform on which you can overlay this communications medium on lots of existing worlds or worlds that you create. So anybody that can build a world in Unity ultimately will be able to import that world into this space. Now that is definitely at odds with the notion of a platform that would like everybody to use the same platform and ideally buy bits of it. Um, however, we're still dependent on third party technology providers. So. Ed mentioned earlier on that we use Agora as our back-end video conferencing system. Now they have hundreds of servers, they have you know, a, um, significant resource and bandwidth for shipping video around and because they have that they're going to do it better than we could have done it. Um, and we are at that point kind of beholden to their servers so there's now a cost associated with running this system which means that we can't simply open source it and say, hey, everybody go do your own thing, because there is actually a bandwidth cost, there is a network cost. Um, and regardless of whether we ran it ourselves, there would be a network and a bandwidth cost. So these things can't be entirely free, which means there needs to be some degree of commercialization, whether that is through a large company like Meta slash Facebook, Microsoft, whomever, making them available for you know, advertising or subscription or whatever, or whether that's through us saying, here, you can have this thing, but you will have to pay a subscription to Agora to be able to use it. Um, or whether it is us saying, okay, here's this thing, and here's a plugin by which you can plug Zoom or Skype or whatever into it, and then separate all those feeds. There's lots of different ways we might approach the problem. Um, and I'll, yeah, and I, would, I would say, you know, I would hope at the very least that, you know, the protocols for the metaverse will be like with the web, uh, support interoperability. And, you know, there have been lots of attempts to do that in the past. The, the virtual reality markup language, VRML, onwards have been attempts for people to define standards for this. So you'd hope at that level things will interoperate. Fingers crossed. Can I thank all of you for joining us today? And uh, it's been great. And uh, might go off and have a go on the Ferris wheel. <laughs> Yeah, enjoy it. Thanks very much, Sean. Bye. So let's look at B. We probably don't want to go that way. So this is going to be a smaller or bigger wire, depending on if you're a mathematician or a computer graphics person. So we're going to go this direction. Now we're looking at E. Uh, and the problem, and I, I think Mike's going to demonstrate this in a second, is that 
Log4j is like milk. It's like water. It's everywhere. 